satisfactory to us that this information may come in kinesthetically and then build from that sensations and then eventually visualizations. So the particular protocols that we used as a training program was to get people to, uh, I mean, you don't want to push down a visual image if it comes because it's like a jack in the box, it'll pop right back up. But we trained them to put images that would come in early in an experiment off to the right hand side of the piece of paper and say possibly analytical overlay. And so most of the training really had to do not with making better remote viewers, but with how to uh, avoid following wrong paths. And so they got better and better at differentiating signal from noise as time went on in, in the particular training procedure that we worked out. Um, the actual manual for doing this is on the web. So you can actually see the whole training manual. On the other hand, there are other people like Pat Price, Joe McMonagle, who are just naturals and don't follow a particular procedure or have developed a procedure of their own. So I, don't, I wouldn't say you necessarily have to have a protocol, but if I were starting from scratch, the idea of making sketches without trying to interpret what they are so that the target happens to be a building, you just find yourself wanting to draw that. Or if it happens to be water, you might go like that. In fact, that's why we got into clay modeling, because it seemed to be this sort of textural thing. Yes? Within the agency that you were working with, were you completely isolated, or did you actually have any contacts or work with people who were involved in other paranormal groups? As far as I know, we, we were privy to whatever was going on. Oh, the, the question was, while we were working with the agency, uh, were we isolated just in our own little project, or did we have access to other paranormal activities going on? As far as I've been able to tell from the history, uh, whatever was going on, we knew about. So, for example, uh, when I went in to brief Director Casey, I mean, it was our job to give him a description of what could be done in the paranormal field, and it would actually be you might say, a mistake on the part of agency personnel if they were to keep data from our briefing uh, protocols, uh, you know, going directly to the director. So as far as I know, there was no other work going on at the same time. There are other programs that attempted to start in other locations, Army Missile Base in Huntsville, for example, and they were all closed off because they just wanted to have one place where everything came together. And it was by that time under the DIA. Though I have not yet uh, come across other activities. So if there, if there were other activities going on, uh, we were never told. And I kind of doubt it. The question was, has our organization ever done remote viewing on UFOs and extraterrestrial things? It was weird enough doing what we were doing <laughs> 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 that we decided that was you know, going to be off the table. Um, on the other hand, occasionally remote viewers would come in and volunteer that they had gone wandering the night before and came up with this data, et cetera, et cetera. And so we turned it in, but we were never specifically targeted. And I do recall one time when we got some, Pat Price, this is in the open literature now, volunteered that he found some UFO bases on the planet. And one of them was in Australia and so uh, somebody in the AI turned the data in. Somebody in the agency called the station chief without telling him why he was asking and said, uh, can you tell me what's going on over there in the Mount uh, whatever, I forget what it was, area. 
And the guy said, oh, you mean where all the UFOs come and go? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one time in, a, in an official remote viewing experiment, we were in the, uh, we were in the office of, uh, probably shouldn't say, a high-level secretary of one of the services. And we we're actually doing remote viewing on, on something. And in the middle of the remote viewing, apparently, according to Ingo Swan, the remote viewer, a UFO showed up on the scene, also viewing the location. And so he just put it down in the corner. But the general was smart enough, or the, the civilian was smart enough to say, well, what's that down in the corner? <laughs> he said, well, I, I don't, I, we don't need to talk about that. It was just something that slipped in. <laughs> so it showed up from time to time. And um, there have been cases where other assets have apparently seen UFOs and remote viewers have been targeted on the locations, but seldom. Question? Your Silver Futures example, was yes. you were looking ahead in time. Right. Do you have other examples of looking ahead or back in time? Many. Um, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. Oh, his question, uh, you know, we, I've given examples of looking ahead in time. Were there other examples of, like in the silver futures, other examples of looking ahead or looking behind? There was one time when, uh, I won't be really spe too specific about it, there had been a nuclear test in another country three months ago. And on the one hand, Visual assets seemed to say it was a dud, but other kinds of assets found them celebrating, and they couldn't figure out why. So when they're desperate, they turn to remote viewers. And so they said, uh, we'd like for you to look at this time and this place, gave us coordinates and a time, but we didn't know what, what it was about. And so what the remote viewer described, which eventually turned out to be confirmed, was that the atomic bomb was dropped and they always want to let them uh, blow up uh, above the land because that's when they make the big effect but the parachute didn't open and therefore it burrowed itself into the ground and then, and then exploded. So the fact that it looked like a dud was because you didn't see the big mushroom cloud and the big effect but the celebration was for the fact that the explosion part worked. And the experiment was even better than that. People from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory went and blew up atomic material, blew up regular dynamite, blew up, they had four scenarios of blowing things up, and they all looked different. And we were at, the remote viewer was asked to say which one looked like the one he saw, and the one he picked out was the one that did correlate with, in fact, what would have been the case there. So there, there's an example of a back in time, in this case, three months. Two questions. Uh, have remote viewers been used as microscopes or perhaps telescopes? Have remote viewers been used as microscopes and telescopes? Well, in a way, as telescopes. Again, Ingo, uh, you know, he's always coming up and saying, well, you know, I think we, do, we need to do something exciting. So this is before the Jupiter flyby by the Voyager. And he said, I think I'll uh, go look at Jupiter and let's take some data because the flyby hasn't gotten there and see if we see something, you know, whatever. So Ingo Swan and Harold Sherman, another famous psychic, uh, and we, we, we taped the, uh, taped the ex experiments, remote viewed Jupiter before the flyby. Uh, Swan said, I wonder if I went to the wrong place. I see some thin rings around Jupiter. Maybe I went to Saturn by mistake, but no, I couldn't have done that because there's the big red uh, tornado thing. And so he reported thin rings. And so right after that, uh, Carl Sagan happened to come by SRI, and so we showed him the data. And he said, no, I'm not impressed. First of all, I see a bunch of stuff in here that you know you can get out of any encyclopedia. And then I see stuff here that's clearly wrong, rings around Jupiter, no rings around Jupiter. So we actually published that in our book, Mindreach, 
before the flyby got there. When the flyby got there, the big news was thin rings around Jupiter. <laughs> and uh, so based on that, they also, uh, he also did a remote viewing of Mercury before a flyby and described a number of things that the astrophysicist, uh, uh, cosmologist didn't expect to see, and it turned out he was right. So they're, they're in the public literature. As far as the microscope activity, we didn't, at least in our lab, but there's a very famous book uh, out of early 1900s where uh, Leadbeater and Besant, famous psychics of the day, remote viewed elements in the periodic table and came up with detailed descriptions uh, which included noting that there was deuterium and tritium, which we didn't know about at the time, and models that some physicists feel match quark models. Um, so that's also, that's published as a book, so you can get that data. Um, there are uh, many of the ex-intelligence uh, people have retired and they teach remote viewing courses. And so um, you can go on the web, find out courses, take the courses from them, and then be your own remote viewer. As far as hiring remote viewers, I, I, I don't know. I don't keep up with uh, you know, what they might do. Okay, I know it's getting late, so I think we probably have to wind. One, one last question. No, we didn't. <laughs> How do we choose our remote viewers since we probably didn't go to the yellow pages, psychic yellow pages? Well, originally, uh, well, you saw how we got Swan. Geller was recommended, so we took him in. He got 90% of the publicity, even though he was like 1% of our work. But uh, in the Army, they found that uh, some remote viewers, the way they selected some of their remote viewers, were that there were certain people that the troops would follow out into the fields in Vietnam because they would never get blown up by landmines. <laughs> and so the Army chose some of those people and sent them our way. But then uh, we also found out that uh, by having volunteers, that many of them uh, who never thought about having psychic functioning, like Helen Hammond, happened to be at SRI for some other experiments, never thought of herself as a psychic. She turned out to be absolutely wonderful. So uh, eventually we did a massive profiling system and uh, it's used by the CIA and uh, have a 256 cubbyhole, 16 by 16, of 256 separate kinds of personalities. And there were two cubbyholes in there that sort of uh, where our best remote viewers came from. So, but by and large I would say you don't have to go that, that far. Essentially, everybody has the ability. Our view is that it's normally distributed, just like musical ability. You've got virtuosos at one end of the scale. You've got tone-deaf people at the other end. And you've got a bell curve. And most people are somewhere in the bell curve, can learn some music, and can learn to do remote viewing. So I think that, that's all you need to know about finding remote viewers. Thanks. <laughs>